But, uh, our speaker, uh, Mark Hardcastle, is going to talk with us about restoring harmony when your world is out of tune. Mark graduated from the U.S. Air Force Academy in 1982 and spent nine years as a military pilot. Today he flies for United Airlines, writes, speaks, and teaches music to young members of the Colorado Children's uh, Choral. Mark has recently published his first book, The Symphony of Your Life, Restoring Harmony When Your World is Out of Tune. It will be for sale after his presentation. Mark back there, he has a little table set up. Uh, it's a very good read, very easy read. I read it in two nights. Nathan was kind enough to let me borrow his copy. I bought a copy for my wife, and she's in the middle of reading it now. Uh, anyway, please uh, help me uh, welcome our speaker, Mark Hardcastle. Got uh, two kids, 
One of them is special needs. The other one has the potential to be an Olympic athlete. And you want to do right by both of them. Yeah, there's this bankruptcy thing going on. Her pension's gone. Income's, you know, not what it used to be. At that point, in the dark, 35,000 feet, it's quiet, passengers asleep. Conversation goes something like this. One guy turns to the next and says, How are you doing? Are you making it? How are you making it? Did you take another job outside United? Have you started your own business? Did you put your wife to work? Your kids? How are you making it? Well, those conversations sort of kind of divided themselves up into these two categories. You know, there were the guys that were kind of making it. <clears throat> kind of not. Not so much. Well, the bankruptcy lasted in excess of three years. You know, I just kind of wallowed until January of 06. And at that point, the, the conversations kind of died down a little bit, a little less frequent. And we all kind of settled into our new reality, post-bankruptcy, that kind of thing. And, and, you know, we moved on. 2006 turned into 2007, 2007, 2008. Well, of course, 2008, <coughs> recession hit. We started hearing those conversations again. And not so much in the cockpit. I mean, that wasn't much more united to do to us. But my friends and neighbors, relatives, everybody started talking. Making it? Well, back when it was pilots, there were those two categories. And in the category of the guys who were making it okay, I started to become vaguely conscious of, of patterns. But like I said, those things kind of died away before I got really clear on that. But by the time my friends and neighbors were asking those same questions, those patterns came back to me, and it had been sort of processing in the back of my mind now for three years. And, and those patterns almost immediately became clear. Things that, that were common among those who were making it, who were having success, and those, those things that were absent, those, those patterns, I started taking notes. The notes became a journal, the journal, a manuscript. The manuscript turned into a book, <coughs> the symphony of your life, restoring harmony when your world is out of tune. Storm harmony when the world's out to you. Symphony goes out to you from time to time. Patterns. Those patterns boil down to three ideas. That's what we're going to talk about today. Simple, not necessarily easy. Three simple ideas. The people I saw around me who were finding success in restoring harmony were people who were kind, people who were determined. People who help others. Simple, not necessarily easy. The first principle I observed among those who were finding success or restoring harmony when their worlds were out of tune was they were kind people. The recession started in 2008, long from somewhere in the middle of 2009. It looked like it was going to kind of maybe stop continuing to get worse. And, and I started looking around. Um, and other people were starting to look around, starting to come out from the hunger down um, mode and, and starting to rebuild. So the people who were rebuilding my first thought was maybe they got off easy. Maybe they weren't suffering as bad as, as everybody else. The second look told me that wasn't true at all. They had suffered as bad as everybody else. They got kicked in the teeth just like, and then, and then there were the folks who were still hungered down. So you got people who are not hungered down, people who are hungry. That's pretty much everybody. So was this a universal experience? Was this something that everybody was experiencing? Yeah, pretty much. So, okay, were we just lucky? 
to live in the 21st century and get to experience this historic hardship? Were we the only ones? Well, of course not. If, and if this kind of thing had happened in the past, maybe we could get some guidance from philosophy. So I look back. I went back 2,500 years. 2,500 years ago, Buddha said life is suffering. Well, I'll buy that, based on what I was seeing at the time. It came forward 500 years. A Greek philosopher, Plato. Plato said that we should be kind for everyone we meet. It's fighting a hard battle. Plato's contemporary Roman lecturer, Epictetus, was the first one I came across who said, folks, it is what it is. Let's come all the way to the 20th century, shall we? 1946, Holocaust survivor Viktor Frankl <clears throat> said, life is not so much a search for pleasure or power as it is a search for meaning. 1978, Hill Scott Peck wrote a runway bestseller called The Road Less Traveled. Got a copy of that book. Open it up. Chapter one, page one, line one. Life is difficult. By Peck and Buddha. Are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> is that the best we can hope for? Absolutely not. Every one of these guys was using that particular statement, that idea as an anchor point, as the beginning of a conversation about how we can create lives of joy, regardless of what's going on around us, happening to us. Five statements, five different philosophers, four of them were mere observations. Accurate, wise, but mere observations. Only one of those guys gave us an action statement. Plato gave us something to do, didn't he? Plato told us to be kind. How was it that those folks that I was seeing around me who were having success were being kind? Had they studied Plato? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe was this something they just knew by instinct? I don't know. But the generalization worked. People who were being successful were being kind to everyone around them. Were they being kind to themselves? Moms are the worst about that, aren't they? <laughs> being kind to everyone around them. Kind of, Jen Slinger, my broker at Keller Williams, uh, one of my heroes. In 2004, late 2004, um, United was still wallowing in bankruptcy. I told you a minute ago, I think, did I, did I tell you it took over three years for us to get out of bankruptcy? I'm not say that. So they'd been in it for you know, a couple of years at that point. No indication they were going to emerge from bankruptcy. So I started to see a trend. People starting other jobs, looking for ways to replace their income in case United went under. I did that when I got a real estate license. In 2004, took the course. <coughs> Early 2005, uh, hung my license down at uh, Keller Williams in the Denver Tech Center. And uh, things started slow for me. In 2006, I started to have a little bit of success. Had some, actually, had a pretty good year in 2006. But uh, you remember that 2007 was the year that real estate started to die. And I, I was planning on doubling my production in 2007 over 2006. I mean, I was building, starting a business. I was trying to replace my United Airlines income, right? So you know you do that. You set your goals. And you know, well, 2007, you, you know where this is going. <laughs> I didn't make my goals. In fact, my production in 2007 was half what it had been in 2006. I, I wasn't liking that trend line. So I went to Jim and asked him, you know, what do I do? I'm doing everything I know how to do. Well, it was his business to mentor and coach. And then he said, well, look, let's do this. Um, here are some more marketing techniques. Here's some lead generation stuff for you to do. 
and let's set up a weekly coaching session and you go out and you hit these numbers here, you do these activities, and then we'll, we'll evaluate on a weekly basis. Great. So first week came and went, didn't make my numbers. Second week didn't make my numbers. Weeks didn't make my numbers. I was failing. I was angry about that. I'm not, that's not me. I'm an airline pilot, you know, military guy. Wow. So I was into one of my coaching sessions and letting Jim understand my frustration level. He let me rant for a little while in his wisdom. Then he stopped me. Settle down, Mark. You know, if you keep this up, it, at best you're going to burn out. At worst, your health is going to suffer. Maybe badly. So we need to learn to be kind to ourselves. All we can do is all we can do. Be kind to ourselves. Be kind. First principle among those who are successful at restoring harmony when the world's went out of tune. They're kind. Second principle. People that I observed at having success at restoring harmony when the world's were out of tune were determined to persevere over, under, around, or through anything that stood between where they were and where they wanted to be. You know from watching American Idol, that Kelly Clarkson won the first contest back in 2002. Since then, she's prospered, uh, released a whole bunch of albums, had a bunch of hits. Her fifth album was called Stronger. It came out in 2011. And uh, the hit that came off of that was Stronger, What Doesn't Kill You. Of course, there's a little more to that statement, right? What she's doing is she's paraphrasing uh, a great 19th century philosopher by the name of Friedrich Nietzsche, who wrote from the Book of Life, That which does not kill me makes me stronger. Thank goodness we have a great 21st century philosopher who can keep that old saw current for us <laughs> and not let it become a cliche. I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a softy. I'm, I'm a sentimental kind of guy, so cliches don't hit me the way they hit most people. Uh, so I, I appreciate that sentiment, the, the sentiment that that which doesn't kill me makes me stronger. You know, and the idea behind that is every obstacle we get over, every challenge we successfully surmount, will give us a tool if we will let it that we can carry forward for the rest of our lives and, and use on the next challenge that we know is inevitable. Thank goodness for Kelly Clarkson. <laughs> Challenges come. We don't need to be frightened. We don't need to give up before the challenge ever gets her. Keep going. Uh, November of 1989, Disney Pictures released a movie animated film called The Little Mermaid. Uh, very successful film. To give you an idea of the number of eyeballs that hit that film, in its first year of release, it made $84 million for Disney Pictures. Its worldwide distribution over the life of the film generated $211 million, which in, in the early 90s was a pretty big number. It was a big number for a, a film. A lot of eyeballs on that. Two of those eyeballs belonged to my daughter, who was born less than a year after the movie came out. September 11, 1990, Anna was born. And so she kind of grew up with the movie. In fact, by the time she was four, she'd seen that movie so many times. I mean, let's face it, if I let her, she sat there all day long, every day, done nothing but watch that movie. Uh, she knew the movie inside, outside, upside down, backwards, every note, and you get the picture. Well, when she was four that year, uh, three of the cast members took the music on tour, and the tour came to Denver. So I got us a couple tickets, and we went down to the Betcher Hall to see the cast of Little Mermaid. Great seats. Now, I, I'm on the stage, you're in the audience, right? Um, our seats were in the balcony, stage right, right up here, which put Anna right in the middle of the action. She could lean right on the rail, look right down on the singers, Felt like she was part of the concert. 
really enjoyed a great concert, but the concert itself wasn't a big deal. The best part of the night was what happened next. Now, as you know, the actress who had voiced Ariel, Little Mermaid, herself, was a young actress by the name of Jody Benson. And as soon as Ms. Benson finished her concert, her performance, she was whisked off into the wings and then went right back around to the lobby to interact with all of her young fans. And Anna, of course, was right in the thick of it, just adoring Jody Benson. <laughs> And Miss Benson was graciously loving her right back. Wow. Well, that was the night that Anna decided she wanted to be a Broadway actress. Anna wanted to have a lead role in a musical just like Joey Benson. Three years later, when Anna was in the second grade, she was invited to join the Colorado Children's Chorale. Now, if you've ever seen the Children's Chorale, it was very likely down in the Badger Hall, because, you know, that's their home concert venue. So, the night came for the first concert, and they got all excited, and, you know, came up and said, Dad, I might even breathe some of the same air as Johnny Benz. <laughs> Thank you. I, you know, <laughs> I thought it was funny. Uh, so and that's about the time, in second grade. That's when theatrical roles start to become available to child actors, actresses. So she started getting out into the, the, um, the theater community in the Denver area and being and, and, and in productions. Um, of course, when she got started, there was no expectation of having a lead role. So, I mean, she was just a newbie. But as she matured and got more involved, that expectation of having that lead role she wanted grew on her. Ten years after that first experience at Bedford Hall, Anna was a senior at Arapahoe High. And up to this point, she still had not had a lead role in any of the productions she'd been in. Well, you know, in high school, every high school does a musical, right? That alone is, a, that's another cliche of its own, isn't it? I mean, it, there's, it's so, they have a high school musical about high school musicals. Right? So, <laughs> so so Arapaho is no different. They were going to put on Damn Yankees uh, the spring of Anna's senior year. And she knew this is going to be it. This is my time. If for no reason other than the fact that I'm the senior now, and there's nobody else above me whose turn it is to have the lead role. You know how that goes, right? And this is the next person I have to so, sure enough, she prepares, it's going to be Dan Yankee, she's all excited about the Lola, and she gets into the production, but again, she didn't get the lead. I remember her disappointment that night in particular. And I thought to myself, Maybe she really just doesn't have the chops. Well, she went to college that fall, just up the road here in Casper, and she managed to win a scholarship to study musical theater. And one of her first challenges was to audition for their fall production, which was going to be a musical called Crazy for You. Finally, after all those gigs as part of the course, she won the role of Polly Baker, the female lead in Crazy for You. Which you know had been played on Broadway by Jody Benson. <laughs> those who are successful at restoring harmony that the world's got to <clears throat> give up. When I was at the Air Force Academy, rising junior, summer of 1980, I had the opportunity to go to the uh, Army's Parachute Training Jump School down Fort Benning. 
and you know, Fort Benning is in Columbus, which you also know is South Georgia. And this was August. Oh. Hot. <laughs> it was hot down there. Uh, three week course, first two weeks, we'll just call that ground school. The third week was reserved for actually jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. <laughs> Five times to get out of silk wings. I was young. Um, and and um, I learned a lot of things during ground school, obviously. One of the things I knew before I went down there um, was that when you come, when you have a parachute, you come, slow, come down slower than if you don't. <laughs> Jerry, I'm going to put you in my suitcase. Take me, take you with me. Everybody. Jerry's laughing at one of my jokes. <laughs> um, but even when you have a parachute, you can still hit the ground pretty hard. And if you're not in good physical condition, you can be injured. So the jump masters spend a lot of the a lot of their time during the first two weeks making sure everybody's in the best possible physical condition before we go out and jump out of those airplanes in week three. We did a lot of push-ups in that Georgia heat. A lot of setups. Just before ground school ended, last day of the second week, the jump masters showed up at the training grounds and said, we're going to go for a one-mile conditioning run. So they, they formed us up. All right, time to form up. Falling. So we did. Four. Hark. Off we went. Double time. Hark. Let's start running. And let's just say they said brisk pace. <laughs> and we got faster. We got faster again. By the time we got to the end of the course, we were at an absolute long searing sprint, glad to see the end of the course coming up. Well, as we got to the last 100 yards or so, the jump master said, all right, everyone, great job. One mile down, one to go. We're going to go for another mile. And as soon as they said that, of course, a bunch of the guys just dropped out of the tomb rest. Just knew. They just knew. They couldn't go another mile. <laughs> <laughs> I just kept running. Maybe another 40, 50 yards. Just enough to get some separation between us and the guys who had dropped down. The jump masters called us to a halt. Quick time. Halt. Who? Halt. Left. I didn't know was because I was 
was so self-absorbed. I was so consumed with my own burning lungs that I wasn't looking around for somebody who might be starting to struggle. So here's how that applies to you today. I know that you guys are running hard. You're working your businesses, your lungs are burning, but you got some challenges. I had a great conversation with Nate, a couple of great conversations with Nate. Jerry and DJ, Holly, where's Holly? Holly, thank you for your time. Mike, we, we, all, we all chatted about the challenges that CIMG members are facing. So I know we've got some challenges. You know, we don't, we don't put that on our faces when we come to the, the networking meetings, do we? But you have your challenges, but I know that most of you are going to be just fine. You're going to thrive. But we've got about 50 people in the room today. And in a room this size, there's somebody who came in here today looking for a lifeline. Somebody who's starting to struggle. So here's what I'd like for you to do. You look like a pretty familiar group. You know, most of you know each other, but you know, if there's a face in here that you haven't put a name to, <coughs> go meet that person today. And even if you know everybody in the room, find somebody in here and invite them into the cockpit at 35,000 feet in the middle of the night over the North Atlantic. Have one of those conversations that matter. How you doing? Are you making it today? Is there some way I can help you. That's what CIMG is all about here today, isn't it? People who succeed get outside of themselves and help others. I've got another story for you. This one is not about restoring harmony. This one is about a guy who didn't. Let's call it a cautionary tale. Captain Z lived in Centennial in 2007. And by all accounts, he was the quintessential airline captain. I, I, my friends told me that he was just the kind of guy that we all love to fly with. I never had a chance to fly with him myself, but they said he, he was technically competent, ran a great crew, fun on the layover. But as you know, back in, 19, uh, or in 2007, airline pilots had to retire at age 60. And he had his birthday in May, and he was required by law to hang up his captain's hat with the scrambled eggs on the bill and the captain's coat with the fourth stripe on his sleeve. And at that point, he had a hard battle to fight. All he'd ever done was fly jets for United. It's all he ever wanted to do. His entire identity was wrapped up in this idea of flying big jets around the world for United. I couldn't do it anymore. His world was out of tune. The day after his retirement became official, he got in his car, drove down to the fire station right over here at Quebec and Dry Creek. Parked his car, pulled out a gun, and shot himself. Captain Z created a permanent solution to 
to what could have been, maybe should have been, temporary situation in his life. Challenges are inevitable. Despair is not. My friend Mark Pogue was another captain for United. And we were all devastated. Everyone, everyone in this room was devastated by the events of 9 11. Mark, more than most. One of the four captains that went down that day, one of those four jets, was a close personal friend and mentor. A few months after that, Mark's nephew, Tyler, was four-wheeling down in the Rampart Range. The Jeep hit something, caused it to roll, hit, hit the roll bar, neck snap. Watch your plate, you A few months after that, Mark was diagnosed with cancer. They found it in time. It was removed. Just in time for them to find a second cancer in another part of his body, this time in his thyroid, Again, the surgery was successful, but one of the comp there was a complication that they damaged one of the nerves that controlled his vocal cords. Couldn't speak. And what I haven't told you about my friend Mark is that in addition to flying jets, he was traveling around the country as a speaker inspiring our youth to live lives without limits. Couldn't talk. And of course, running in the background this whole time was this whole United Airlines bankruptcy thing. He was a pilot, lost half his income, couldn't make his house payment, lost his home to foreclosure or personal bankruptcy. Heavy list. But you never know any of that happened unless you knew it didn't happen. He's one of the most positive, optimistic, fun to be around people I have ever known. It confounds me how that dichotomy can exist in any individual. It's a wonder that that dichotomy can exist in the world. A few months after his vocal cords recovered, I, I asked him about that. He said, you know, Mark, sometimes life kicks you where it hurts. And you can either lay there and moan, or you can get up and move on with what's important. That was it. Simple. Not necessarily easy. That's what he did. Recovered from personal tragedy, recovered from the surgical complications, recovered from the financial disasters. Today, Mark's back out flying jets for United. But in addition to that, he meets with every class of new hires. See, these are the good times with United Airlines now. We're expanding, we're hiring as fast as we can. We got a lot of new hires coming on. Every group of new hires gets to meet with Mark Hope. And Mark asks them this question. What do you bring that nobody else can bring to United Airlines to make us a great company again? And then, of course, these, these new hires, they fly for a couple of years for United, and then they get to be captains. And guess what? All of the new captains get to meet with Mark O. And he asks them again, a little differently this time. Why should I give you a fourth stripe? We were just talking about it. Now. What do you bring to the cockpit that nobody else can bring that will make us a great company again? What do you bring, for that matter, Captain, to life that nobody else can bring that will make the world a better place? Those who are successful, outside and help others, yes, Marco still is not flying jets around the world. He's not inspiring new hires, training new captains. He still goes all over the country, speaks to our youth, helping them understand how to live life without limits. Just a few minutes, we're going to go back out to our lives. If you feel like 
this message might be useful to another organization, do me a favor. Pull out a business card, write the word group on it, meet me back there by the autograph table on your way out. I'm going to have some books for you there. Um, you can buy them at, on Amazon for 20 bucks plus shipping and handling, but I'd like to do something a little special. Uh, would it be okay if I offered the books for $15 today as opposed to the 20 plus? Sounds good to me. Okay, thanks. <laughs> well, I'd love to do that for the event price today, uh, 15 bucks back there. I'd love to autograph one for you and send you on your way with a copy of my book. Last story. May 18th, 2012. I was over to Moab. A bunch of my friends go there to get ride mountain bikes. We're on our first ride of the trip. Happened to be the Porcupine Rim Trail. If you've been over to Moab and you've ridden that trail, you know that. The first 45 minutes after the Coca-Cola Trail hit, you're freewheeling down through the willows. Uh, and then at that point, it crosses a paved road. So I, I skipped up on the pavement, back down into the dirt on the other side. And that's when I saw this, uh, this half-buried log there in the trail. There was a rock outcropping over here and some... some I, so I, I remember thinking to myself, maybe I'm going to have to jump there or find a way around it. That's the last thing I remember from the ride. Between that last memory and my next, apparently I made the wrong decision. Because <laughs> I went over the handlebars at about 20 miles an hour, landed square on the top of my head, tumbled in the gravel and lay there on the trail unconscious for a better part of 10 minutes. My next memory is recognizing I'm still on the trail. It wasn't moving. In fact, I couldn't. came along, pulled out the cell phones, called 911, got an emergency response. 45 minutes later, the ambulance arrived up on the trail to me. Paramedics put me on the backboard, slipped me into the back of the ambulance, 45 minutes back down to the Moab, Moab emergency room, took x-rays. We found out that my neck was broken in five places. My world was out of tune. So what did I think about during those months of recovery, those long days, longer nights, of hard of being able to move? I went like, oh, well, my life as I knew it might be over. Second thing was I might not ever be able to regain the full use of my right arm. But then I thought about Mark, how he responded his challenges with overconfidence. I thought about Anne, how she responded to her challenge with perseverance and determination. They inspired me to get up and do what may not be done. 18 months later, the book was finished. That's why I had to come and have this conversation with you today. And now, it's time for you. Go back out to your lives. Step up onto your podium. You'll take with you the totality of everything you've ever learned about your own symphony, including what we talked about today, about how challenges are inevitable, and how you can restore harmony by being kind, being determined, helping others. And as you restore harmony, and those challenges present themselves. You're going to find yourself conducting a beautiful symphony. Yeah, it will be.